This part of the conference we have called Lost in Translation, from uh, conventions to daily life on the ground, the implementation on the ground. So, what in, in your view, and you are all practitioners on the ground, what is the most important tool to, to convey all these nice words in the conventions, Molly mentioning, into the ground, work on the ground? What do you think? Oh, <laughs> I think uh, definitely uh, that it has to be done in a way that people can really relate it to their daily lives and that would take on meaning in their lives. It has to be in their own language. We found that um, it was very critical that uh, it be in, in national languages uh, that people spoke because most of the people we work with have never been to school. Um, and also, uh, w w when we started human rights education, people were bringing the human rights instruments, the articles, and going into the communities and saying, these are your human rights, and it didn't mean anything to people so much. And so what we tried to do was extract the principles from the different human rights instruments and use drawings, use things they could relate to, and um, talk to them about uh, this, not impose it, but rather ask people what they thought about it. And again, as I said earlier, I think the most critical thing was getting them to look at whether these principles actually corresponded to their deeper values, having people really talk about what those values are. And again, um, I would emphasize the importance of working with religious leaders uh, one of the things we do systematically now is do seminars, uh, human rights seminars, with the religious leaders. And sometimes people think that the religious leaders are, they look at them almost as enemies. When in fact, if you include them and make them, we, we even say you have to be leaders of this movement and show how the human rights, for example, for every human right we discuss, there is a verse from the Quran, for example, because we work in mostly uh, Islamic countries, and, and then getting them to really dialogue. And they actually are doing sermons on Friday in the mosque on the importance of these human rights. They're doing them at baptisms and at marriages. They're talking about the importance of not marrying your a daughter when she's only a child. And they are talking about ending female genital cutting. So I think that those things are very important to keep in mind. Salil, what from the perspective of, uh, of Amnesty International, what's the most important tool? Can you pass over the mic to him? Oh, you all, you have one, yes. I hope okay, it works. I yeah. yeah, I think it works. Thank you. Um, just to give you a concrete example, so if you take South Africa, for example, uh, which, is, which, which has a constitutionally guaranteed set of not just civil political rights, but economic social rights as well. So it's justiciable. If the South African government doesn't deliver on health or education or water, um, any citizen could take them to court. So if you take the issue of maternal mortality or the number of women dying during childbirth and sort of the health side, South Africa, as far as I'm aware, is if you take the base year of 2000 for the Millennium Development Goals, South Africa is the only African country where the maternal mortality has actually increased. The number of women dying has actually increased compared to what it was in 2000. Yeah. So we looked at this whole question of, you know, what's really going on? Because anti And we established that the maximum number of deaths are happening during the antenatal care stage, when, when if the women are not having the right antenatal care, then you obviously have a lot of deaths happening, and, and not just death, but uh, related problems. Um, and in theory, antenatal care is free for women. So when we looked at this question more deeply, what we found out was that a lot of the women are not going, particularly in far-flung areas and poorer women, they don't go to the centers because when they go to the centers, they end up getting mandatorily tested for HIV, which they're not supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, USAID, the PEPFA program, which is the world's largest HIV AIDS program, actually insists that you have to build health centers, which are PEPFA health centers, which are physically separate, so they can know that their money has been spent properly. So if you're going to a PEPFA center, any woman going there, they know that she must be HIV. You know? mm -hmm. so, so they simply don't go for the antenatal care. And I'm, and I'm giving you this as an example because Amnesty International, when we say how do we translate from, from norms to practice, there are four tools we use. Number one is evidence. If you don't have your facts and your evidence right, you're not going to be able to change the way in which the government thinks or, or acts. 
So like on this piece of work we did on antenatal care and the impact on women in South Africa, that piece of research took one year. We have to get the facts right. The second thing is then you need to talk to the government. You should be able to talk to them, lobby them in a way that's you know, clear, compelling. The third thing is you need to use the media, both electronic and uh, the traditional media. And the fourth is mass mobilization. So we move our members, we move our activists, and you know, this combination of these four things is tried and tested. It's not, there's no rocket science about it. I think any good campaigning organization uses it. You use the right mix at the right time. Atia, you, as you said in your, in your presentation, tax is a word that very few thought about in connection with human rights. How do you see your course in the transformation from norm to reality, from normative to reality? Wow. I think that it, it's, there's, a big, there's been a big change over the past five or six years um, because when, when the argument first came out that rights require resources, everybody thought it was obvious and then nobody thought it was worth saying. And then when we started to begin to unpack, well, the people that I do research with, when we began to unpack what that meant, then there was always the, either you would get the argument that this is obvious and what's the big deal, or you would get the argument that no, human rights are idealistic. And I think that the only way you can move it is to actually begin to um, talk about how to make that real. And I think that for me, the problem has been, um, like if you look at the right to health and you took a look at access to medicines, I, some of the research I look at, it, it's so unclear as to how much money is required. And I know it sounds very cut and dried, but the only way that you can move the revenue towards the right is if the rights can be crystallized more clearly. Now, of course, this has its own challenges because um, one person will have HIV, somebody else will have diabetes, somebody else will have cancer. So even trying to unpack the resource at that basic level is going to be a problem. But there are, there's a lot of research coming out of the, the Euro European Commission now um, that is looking to see how to achieve the 2015 goals, the MDG ones, and then push past it. And I think that is how it will move, but very slowly. So the word idealistic, you're saying that gives kind of, of a negative uh, association? Yes. It, yes. So in, in tax circles, if you turn around and say these are idealistic goals, for a tax person or a, a resource person, that just means this is something in a utopia somewhere out there, and we may or may not get at it. And unfortunately, because they are couched in that way as an ideal, the, the tax person is going to say, well, I can't put money on an ideal tell me what to spend the money on. And this has been the argument that I usually have with human rights people. Because when I tell them, well, you want access to essential medicines, here's the WHO list, let's make the list, let's quantify it, let's put money on it. And then I can, then I can tell you how much in your budget needs to go there. So that's the, getting that across has been quite can difficult. I, can I just say one thing? Yeah? I don't want to interrupt your flow, but <laughs> because having worked, lived and worked in Kenya and, and yeah. done a lot with governments, you know, it is quite a classic thing for governments to tell you we don't have the money or we don't have yeah. the capacity. So I was giving you the example of the Philippines last week I was there and they said that, you know, we, this whole how do you stop torture in the Philippines, they said the police have no capacity, they need to be trained. So I asked them, so did somebody train you on how to torture? <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, so when they want to torture, they don't need a training program, mm -hmm. they don't need funding. When you have to stop torture, you need money. Did and you get an answer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, in this audience, there are several um, members of com what we call the NGO community. And in many countries, we are now seeing a limitation of NGO space. And Frank Mugisha, what impact will that have for implementation of human rights on the ground? Um, I think it's um, a very difficult situation. Actually, recently, we worked with Amnesty to release a report uh, Uganda ruled by the law, because we're seeing that the government of Uganda is trying to create so many legislations that will limit the space of civil society. But maybe to take you back, I think Uganda cannot run away from, uh, actually, especially the government, cannot run away from uh, implementing human rights uh, in the political framework in Uganda, because the government currently, when they came into power, they had a lot of respect for international law. In fact, they built a very good constitution. So I think the starting point will be going to ask Uganda, why don't you go back to your own constitution that you built and respect it? We've got um, uh, lots of systems and structures that have been created by the government, all put in place 
But going and looking back and saying, do they work? We have uh, commissioners of inquiries, we have human rights, a human rights commission, you know, we have um, different commissions. But looking at those structures, are they in um, words or are they in practical? And then trying to bring in human rights mechanisms and asking the country, again, go back to your human rights, rather to your own constitution, and maybe that's when we shall see that the space of civil society being uh, respected. So what about the NGOs and the limitation of NGOs? Uh, the limitation, the, the sp because right now, the future of Uganda lies in civil society and NGOs. So the limitation of that space is definitely creating a wider problem. Uh, Althea, how do you see this? In more and more countries, we are seeing limitation of NGO space. What impact will that have? Well, it's the NGOs that are pushing the human rights agenda. And as long as you reduce their space, then there is a lower likelihood that you're going to have the financing of human rights. And within financing circles, for example, at the OECD, there's a lot of discussion sometimes that say that there isn't any value of human rights. And now if you don't give the civil society the space, then what will happen is you won't have that voice coming through. And unfortunately, that is, that is what is being compromised right now at the international level as far as aid is concerned. It's the moving away from human rights. Do you agree, Molly? Um, actually, we haven't had that uh, that problem in the countries that uh, that that we're working in. We have strong support from the government on um, programs, and we did think that we were going to have some trouble in certain countries around the vocabulary we used. We we tried to change that a bit to to talk about human rights in terms of human dignity, because human dignity is something that everyone can come around and, and promote and. Um, I think that um, the fact that we use a respectful reproach, approach to uh, presenting these, these different uh, human rights to has made a difference. It's not an aggressive one of uh, imposing, rather one of a peaceful confirmation that we now understand these rights. We now know that they're in our constitution. A lot of people did not realize that these human rights were in their constitution uh, and learning about that and understanding and that, but there is a way to go about that and people didn't always understand how you actually apply that. So within our classroom, I always say it's like a rehearsal. Uh, how do you go and talk to the local officials? How do you tell them, we know that we've given our taxes, we paid our taxes now, mm -hmm. and, and now we expect to have the services that we deserve because we have the whole community has fully paid their taxes. But you don't do this in an aggressive way. You say, how can we partner? Yeah. How can we work together? And with this approach, we've had great success. I think uh, the, the, the villagers have told me that they now are getting response from the local authorities and working together with them. They have even created from the community management committees, they've federated. And they now have, uh, on a zonal level, is a lobbying group that says we now want to be very much involved in the budgets and understand what's going on and be much more taken into consideration. And that lobby, that group of people really has made a huge difference. But I think we're lucky that we are working with governments who greatly support um, the NGO work, not just Tostan, but uh, many of the organizations uh, that exist and are promoting these rights. Salil Shetty, we also see a limitation of freedom of speech in many countries. What impact does that have on, on your work? They're all interrelated issues. You know, I mean, if you look at the pattern, it's not like there's one country suppressing freedom of expression, another restricting civil society space. There's a clear pattern and overlap. I think, you know, either governments believe in these things or they don't. And they're pretty good at learning from each other. We were talking about capacity building. They're, I mean, for example, if you take the Nigerian government, they have now asked for advice from the Sri Lankan government on how to kill their own people. Because the Sri Lankans did such yeah. a good job. You know, 40,000 Tamils killed uh, before you, you blink an eye. And now under the guise of Boko Haram, and you know, there's no question that Boko Haram is doing uh, is what we've declared as crimes against humanity. But if you look at the killings by the Nigerian army, and they are now getting uh, Sri Lankan support to do this. So I, I think that there's a clear pattern. You can see where this is happening. And on both NGO legislation, freedom of expression, uh, kind of constricting of spaces, 
There is, and as far as amnesty is concerned, our response is, in a sense, it, it strengthens our resolve to do more in, these, in this, um, to support people like Frank who are at the front end, because at least with amnesty, they're a bit more careful, you know, but if you're a frontline human rights defender, you're dispensable. Yeah. So we see the role of organizations like Amnesty is really to support and strengthen those who are on the front line. And um, we're very grateful for people in Norway, etc., who become members of Amnesty in large number, who allow us to do that. And when we support, it's very different for them because, you know, at least we are not seen as a kind of Western, or we're seen a little bit as Western, but it's still seen as a global movement of people. So I think it's easier for us to support them. And uh, can I can I yes, add this is this is where financing can have a part to play in helping because when you give military aid to a country, then you should be able to record it somewhere. You have to sign a, a memorandum of agreement with another country. These documents are all kept secret. Now I can understand why the number of arms you have in a country you want to keep secret, your state security and all of that, but certainly not the trainings, certainly not um, who is moving from what country to what country, with whom you have exchanges with, what sort of memorandum of agreement you have. I mean, of course, this is a very hot and defense always protects this, but there are parts of it that can be slivered out, that can begin to show what direction is going. And, and Kenya is receiving training from Israel. Yeah. Um, let me ask you about the issue of social media. Several of you uh, no noted that in your uh, presentations. Social media can create enormous mobilization, like the Coney case uh, did a few years ago. But how can, what can you do to convert this into to, to active action and results? Yeah. No, I think, you know, like we, we, if you look at the classic sort of uh, the global level, there are some organizations like Avas, for example, which has grown phenomenally in terms of getting up to 40 million members online, and including in the developing world, where we are, you know, we are now, Amnesty is putting a very strong focus on getting, building our membership and constituency in Africa and Asia and Latin America. But ours has done a great job. Uh, we, but the thing is that at the end of the day, you can have a lot of people who are, who are digitally active, but if you don't have the offline presence, mm -hmm. the political impact is simply not there. So, and I'm not suggesting that one is less important. It's very important to have online presence, growing and more and more important. But there is no substitute to having, you know, human beings. I remember this, uh, this coming from our Amnesty Italy, that when they sent uh, a lot of uh, letters, you know, huge number of, uh, you know, sort of emails to, I think, the mayor of Rome on some issue, they just kind of, you know, they ignore these email-based things. You just send 50 letters actually signed by real people and they take it much more seriously because they know that these people are real, they have a name, they have an address, they are voters. Digital, fine, you know. Is that the same with you, Frank, that the, all this digital activity doesn't count the same way as you said, Ugandan celebrities, Ugandan reporters, yeah. live people is more important? Um, it, it, it has some impact, but if you look at Uganda, you're looking at uh, what percentage of people use social media. Because social media is mainly in the city and also in um, semi-urban areas. So the percentage of people who use social media is not really so big, but I think strategically targeting the people who are going to overturn this uh, social media into reality, like uh, journalists who maybe can write about what you're tweeting or what you're Facebooking about, I think that can, uh, can, can create an impact. Or getting radio presenters who can transform this, because you find that not even so many Ugandans uh, own smartphones to be able to go on social media. So the impact for social media for us has mainly been um, sending out information uh, on the international scene more than on the local scene. Mm -hmm. I have one question for all of you and to, to wrap up now. We have been talking about uh, aid and international support the whole day, but can it also do harm? Do you have any example in your courses when in international support and aid has done harm, Molimit? Um, or weakened the course? Uh, I, I think I, I found mostly that international aid has do, done harm where People have not gone in and first really listened um, at the community level, particularly in community work, have really listened to people first. 
and try to understand what their deeper values are and, and, and what their goals are for the future. And sometimes I find, again, I've lived 40 years in Senegal, so I have seen a lot of people coming in and all very good intentions. Um, but when you really start looking at what the deeper values of people are, you, you realize that a lot of the Western uh, goals are very different from people's goals and that they can align with human rights, but it's just different. And so sometimes people see this as people outside people trying to impose on them. Uh, and and it, it, it is so much better to start with um, where they are. Uh, and start saying, okay, you're here, and where do you want to be, and how can we support you to achieving your goals is, is for me, uh, a, a way to go, I call it empathic development. You, because using empathy and saying, okay, we're, you all have been to university, how many seminars like this have you attended where it has raised the consciousness of us over how many years? How many years have, has it taken us to defend women's rights and, and, and uh, everyone's rights in general? I mean, when you, if you look at where we were 40 years ago and where we are today, and we're working with people who, who've never heard this before, never discussed these things. These were taboo issues that no one ever talked about, and now we are. And so we have to start where people are, listen to them, and work with them very carefully with a language, I think, that is not aggressive, one of understanding. And I think it opens doors to dialogue and to people coming together, coming to consensus. And as you said, building movements is so critical. Uh, seeing that so many other people agree and are now joining movement. Again, I always think it's important that it be a positive movement, uh, not one against, but rather for. That we're all in this for health, for well-being, because everybody can come together around that. I think that's really important also. Atia, do you have an example of um, don't harm? Yeah, well, I have two examples. One which was bad that's becoming better, and one that is still having a problem. And the first one was every time development aid would come into developing countries, you know, you'd have these beautiful signs saying, you know, finance by DFID or finance by the European Commission. And that was great because you see the hospital and you're happy, but from a tax perspective, this did a lot of damage because the taxpayer doesn't see the state as being the provider of the service or the good. And the result of that is there was now allegiance developing within states towards these international donor bodies and to countries outside their own. And since we already have a very weak link between the citizen and the state, this started to undermine it. But the good thing is a lot of the, I think it's the Scandinavian countries that no longer put up those signs. Um, um, other countries still do, but I know Finland definitely doesn't. And so there are countries that are taking a step forward because they've noticed the problem. So that's the bad one going good. And the one that is bad that continues to give problems is the decision by development aid agencies to separate their accounting systems completely from the state's accounting system. And since, of course, developing countries' accounting systems were poor, they were weak, there was a lot of corruption, they, the development aid agencies and um, uh, states in the West decided to split the accounting completely. So now what you have is you have the money coming in through the government body. The government spends more time doing the accounting processes for the development aid, but then even more tax money gets lost in the, in the process. So this double accounting that now takes place has caused a lot of problems. And so far, I haven't seen any um, change in a direction to start to consolidate it. Frank, we're talking human rights and, uh, and, and democracy here. Uh, do you have an example of human rights causes that have been harmed by international support? Um, I think Uganda has been um, in the controversy in terms of um, development aid and especially on LGBT issues. And we've had um, a few issues where our politicians and government have scapegoated uh, international uh, public statements from international figures, you know, to, for example, to say in the anti girl recently in Uganda. And what has happened is, as uh, working with civil society and my colleagues in Uganda, we've tried to craft methods and information that we provide to international partners on how they can respond uh, to Uganda, especially on LGBT issues. And in some countries that has helped, because now we are seeing Right now, we have um, the anti-gay legislation being talked about, but we're not seeing countries jumping out and saying, we're going to add, cut aid to Uganda, we're going to suspend this to Uganda. And you know, the Ugandan government has gotten that you know, aid fatigue now, because they know countries, they only say suspension, then they give the aid after. 
so they know it will come. And they continue, you know, with all these human rights violations. And then the, the other thing is, you know, it's a tough love issue. Because then how do you also continue supporting a politician who you know is using this for political popularity? And then how do you, you know, how do you balance that? And then how do you also promote your own uh, country values in, a, um, in another country? For example, the values of Norway are human rights. And how do you con continue supporting a country that is violating other people's rights? So the message we are saying is, I wish we could respond more globally when it comes to LGBT issues and not single out one country. And also, if we respond generally with all other human rights, so that we're not scapegoated as looking at only one issue. Yeah, and, and not okay. using aid suspension, if we can um, use the aid actually to dialogue and talk to governments. The last word goes to you. No, I think you know, the West is uh, quite well known for its double standards. So you have darlings, I mean, <laughs> so, so you know, like, <laughs> if you take, uh, I mean, right now, the classic case, so, if Saudi Arabia is involved in human rights violations, yeah. uh, it's okay, yes. you know, because yeah. they're part of the U.S. Uh, sphere of influence. Uh, if Iran does it, everyone will come down like a ton of bricks on them. So it's selective. But I mean, in Africa, of course, we've had all the darlings. I mean, Museveni was a darling. I mean, the Nordics have been a little bit discriminatory, but the British and the Americans went gung-ho, you know, and, and Meles Zenavi in Ethiopia, Kagame, and now slowly, you know, the kind of the, the gloss is going off, and I think people are getting more serious. But I remember a classic billboard in Lungi Airport in Freetown when I landed, talking about billboards. <laughs> So this, this billboard said, we know you can't help us, but at least please don't harm us. And <laughs> okay, <thought> yes. <laughs> I thought that was very yeah. courageous, but I think the only point I'd make, which is I, I wouldn't take the kind of Bill Easterly, you know, anti-aid kind of, you know, that's a bit sort of Taliban view against aid. But uh, in a more balanced sort of way, I think the fact that the accountability chain is weakened is problematic. I mean, I don't believe necessarily that our governments in the developing world have a very strong social contract between tax and service they delivery do. to start with, but it is true that once you're getting into international aid, it weakens it further. And this links back to the earlier, the first point you asked. It's equally true for NGOs. And so in Amnesty, for example, we are really pushing that our amnesties in the developing world also start raising money locally. So there is, so you know, there's no, I don't believe, like for example, Amnesty in Senegal. Why is it that Senegalese people can't support Amnesty in Senegal? Financially, but through activism. And then otherwise, if you don't, if you don't, if you're not rooted locally, and if it's all coming from outside, there is a problem. So I hope that NORAD can as much support your partners in building local rootedness as much as you give them funds for doing their work. Okay, I thank you for this conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank <clears throat> you.